25 years and counting, the long, exciting journey continues for ABC's Wide World of Sports. All days begin the same. But after that, can yours compare to theirs? To that of the triathlete and a day of work that would put most of us in over our heads? Can you imagine what it's like to be in their shoes on their bike? Or to be left without what you need to be driven? Only to be driven by yourself. By day's end, do you hope to stand out from the crowd? Or like them, are you trying to catch up to it? When the clock reads six, do you relish the rewards? Or could you just skip it, keep going? and eat on the run? By late night, could you dream of your muscles still in motion? They can, and they do. Theirs may be the greatest work day of all. But it's not something you only see on TV. It's real. What you've just seen is the completion of a dream for Reverend Jim Curtis. Had the clock read, oh, seven minutes later than it does right now, it would have been a mission incomplete. But Reverend Jim Curtis is only one story in a story of 1,022 dreams that began at 7 o'clock this morning in the Pacific Ocean off the island of Hawaii. I'm Al Troutwick, and this is our coverage on ABC's Wide World of Sports of the 1985 Ironman Triathlon World Championship. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sport, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat. The human drama of athletic competition. This is ABC's Wide World of Sports. Brought to you by Mercury, cars that have kept up with the times as much as you have. Mercury, the shape you want to be in. By Bud Light, everything else is just a light. By U.S. Armed Forces, it's a great place to start. And by Metropolitan Life and affiliated companies. Get met, it pays. It was a special week in Hawaii, where one could see the power of Kilauea, the power of man, and perhaps an omnipresent power from above. Heavenly Father and King of the universe, we thank you and ask your blessing upon this human achievement and endeavor. We ask that you create a safe and a joyous experience. They all came together at dawn in the Kona Coast town of Kailua at the Ironman Triathlon World Championship. The methods of preparation, the styles of getting ready, were as different as the people themselves. They tried to make sure that their minds were ready, and that their equipment was too, for they would need it all. It was time to say goodbye to those who loved you and get one last hug for luck. This was a day one did it all alone. Amidst all this activity was a bicycle simply labeled number two. It belonged to Scott Tinley, who was favored to be number one by day's end. He had won once before, but in each of the three years since, he had finished second to this man, four-time champion Dave Scott, perhaps the first king of Kailua since Kamehameha. 
Instead of competing, Scott would be one of our commentators. And with his absence from the race, Tinley was the man to watch. He wore his poker face. While Julie Moss wore an anxious one, the cruel Iron Man had brought Julie to her knees in 1982. The collapse cost her the victory as she crawled across the finish line. She was in Hawaii to try again in a very competitive field of women. And while they were two of the favorites, there were so many others to watch. Some dreaming to be winners, others just finishers. All trying to prove something different to others or to themselves. They had come from all over the world to push their body to what we might think the limit and beyond. <laughs> 7 a.m. Time to begin the 140.6 mile journey. For more than 4,000 arms and legs, the chill of early morning and the sense of anticipation instantly became a thing of the past. The present meant avoiding an errant kick, an elbow in the side, a wave in the face, and finding a small piece of the Pacific of their very own. Watching in the distance was a woman who knows a lot about challenging the ocean and winning. And she was working with us that day. Here is Diana Nyad. This, the Ironman, was my very first event for ABC five years ago. Only 108 people, as opposed to over 1,000, stood at the start. And I suppose they've lost something in eccentricity and gained something in sophistication. For the most part, they know their bodies better now. They know when to eat, what to eat, when to push, when to hold back. But one thing always remains the same, a healthy fear and respect for the event. OK, a few years ago, it manifested itself in not knowing what was to lie ahead during the day. And today, these people have that very same fear, oddly enough, but it stems from precisely knowing what lies ahead. The swim course covered 2.4 miles of ocean over an elongated rectangle out to a boat marker and back. But this year, Hurricane Nellie threatened the islands and sent her swells Iron Man way. Water temperatures mid-70s, surface conditions slow rollers, not optimal. Slowly, one of the swimmers emerged from the pack. Slicing through the water was a student from Saratoga, California, Chris Hinshaw. He was recognized in the triathlon as a great swimmer looking to improve on last year's eighth place finish. Attention turned to the orange-capped women and their first pace setter, who was Salt Lake City's Robin Masters. At one point, Robin felt some body contact with the man next to her and reared her head to see what was happening. Back at the start, there was concern and sympathy for Paloma Roales Brown as she emerged from the water, hyperventilating, crying, and confused. It was a sad contrast to the explosion of human spirit that had been seen at the start. 24 minutes after the start, the two male leaders reached the turnaround boat. Californian Michael McCaffrey had moved into first now with Chris Hinshaw literally at his heels. The unusual swells, especially out at this 90-foot depth region, would mean nothing to these experienced ocean swimmers. And especially notice McCaffrey's ability here to look up and forward for bearings without losing any surface speed. Many primary land lovers behind them were zigzagging with disorientation instead of making a beeline for the boat. Now having missed a half hour of time, Paloma remained on the beach, far from her Seattle home, so close to seeing her dream end before it began. The name being murmured on the crowded pier in Kailua was Hinshaw, for now it was Chris who owned the Blue Waters off Hawaii. He had pulled away from Michael McCaffrey, and the two of them had pulled away from the rest of the field. Somewhere in among those flashes of white was the would-be winner of this Ironman triathlon. Back at the start, with the clock having elapsed 35 minutes, Paloma Roales Brown reacted to all the encouragement. She gingerly re-entered the ocean. The women's leader heading toward shore was still 26-year-old Robin Masters. She displayed a classic distance pool freestyle stroke, very slight kick with a quick arm turnover. Diana, this was the complete 140.6 mile challenge. After the swim, there was the bike course that measured 112 miles through the black, lonely lava fields to the village of Javi and back. Then the marathon course of 26.2 miles through the town of Kailua and back again to the pier, the finish line, and finally, rest. As the swim neared its end, an important transition approached. Here is Dave Scott. During the last 10 to 15 yards, the athletes are thinking about the next step, the cycling stage. And as they approach the ramp, uh, generally their legs are pretty stiff. Their equilibrium 
off a little bit from being, from being in a horizontal position for 50 plus minutes. The transition time is very, very critical, even a race of this length. Uh, in 1983, Scott Keeley and I finished 33 seconds apart. And who knows, it could have been made up in the transition period. That transition would first be entered 49 minutes, 53 seconds into the race by Chris Hinshaw, who stroked and kicked 44 seconds better than the next. His legs supported his body for the first time in a while, but he looked steady, removed his ID tag, raced through the shower, and prepared to change clothes and ride out of town. Robin Masters emerged in an impressive fifth place overall, but her strongest segment was over. Time to ward off the oncoming bikers of the field. And while the pier received the early arrivals, the sea of humanity was still visible in the distance. That swim, however, was already in the past for Chris Hinshaw. And Dave Scott, this was one quick visit to the transition area. Last year, Chris Hinshaw came out of the water in second place. He was able to maintain that spot throughout mile 25. Here, Chris was having some difficulty with his pedal, sliding his shoe onto the single shaft. This year, Chris told me that his game plan was to lead throughout the entire 112-mile bike course. And he rolled through the shadows of that huge banyan tree and gave it one last look behind him. Five minutes behind Chris, a man emerged, and it was Chris's 48-year-old father, who has combined a career and training for the triathlon to the admiration of his family. I'm a defense lawyer who specializes in the practice of defensive physicians in professional negligence cases, otherwise known as medical malpractice cases. The court starts around 9 o'clock and usually finishes at 5 when you're trying a case. Uh, on top of that, it's customary usually to spend sometimes in the morning an hour and a half before, and in the evening you may spend as much as two hours afterwards. And I have a I usually find that to get away from the telephones, I have to work on Saturdays and Sundays. Ed Henshaw's day begins long before that 9 a.m. walk into the office with breakfast, the morning paper, and sweat. I think in terms of my ability to spend the time with my children to train is probably in terms of self-satisfaction the number one reason why I do what I do in terms of training and competing. I'm an extremely uh, fortunate individual in that regard that I, one, have the children that will allow me to do it, two, that I have the physical ability to do it. There is an unspoken relationship that exists, I think, between my, my children and myself and my uh, understanding with them their agony of defeat and thrill of victory, if you may because I can share that with them. It's created a bond between all of myself and all four of my children and my wife. I think my husband is a very special person. He's uh, a very respected trial lawyer in, um, in the area, and he's also a very good athlete. And, um, and the children and I are always impressed with that he can put both of them together. He's a, um, he's a good role model, especially, you know, most dads, they, um, they just go to work and come home. Yeah, my dad, he comes home and he, he swims with me. And um, it's just, it's fun. It's very nice to have him having swimming with you. And I think it, it brings um, he and I closer and essentially the whole family closer. Does so well um, athletically and professionally. It's just unbelievable that he can do it. And um, I just hope, hope when I get older, I can do one third of what he does. Well, the big thing is he's a big motivator. And he's one person that you could definitely look up to. I've got to admit, he does everything exactly. I mean, it's perfect. Ed Henshaw, 14th out of the water with quite a swim, with quite a family. Behind him, the third wave of swimmers rose from the harbor. And in that busy crowd, ready to pursue Ed's son, was Scott Tinley. He was delayed by what was reported as a collision with a buoy in the confusion at the start. He was six minutes behind and in a hurry. Chris Henshaw was zooming towards Javi, which was the halfway point of the bike run. The Queen Ka'ahumanu Highway was his, and so was the lead. Two minutes behind Chris was 22-year-old Danny Banks, who was seventh out of the water and was not expected to be where he was. Could he possibly keep up the pace? At the transition, a determined Scott Tinley was ready to begin the chase. Barely taking time to dress completely, his mood was obvious and his intention clear. You could almost hear the crowd chant. He is 
Robin Masters was pushing hard to escape the pier, knowing that this winning feeling must soon give way to the toughest women's field ever assembled for the Ironman. Juliana Brenning, seventh the year before, had developed consistency throughout the year in shorter races. Julie Moss had earned enough credentials around the world to be touted as one of the odds-on favorites to take the victory here. And a Stanford Phi Beta Kappa, Joanne Ernst, had quietly said she was ready. Eyeglasses and other necessities of life for swimmers out of the water. It belonged to Pat Griskus, trying to prove a lot to himself and reluctantly being an inspiration to us all. Since I've done my first marathon, uh, I remember about two, three weeks before I, I had done it, the, uh, I watched the 80, the 80, I guess it was the fall 82 Ironman was shown in, uh, in the winter of 83. And uh, I was just fascinated by the thing. And I realized that at the time that I, you know, I'd probably never be able to do this, but, but you know, wouldn't it be, you know, a trip if I could? And, uh, you know, here two and a half later, you know, two and a half years later, I'm here. Uh, it's very easy to be a, a, a professional inspiration. Uh, I don't know that uh, that's what I am, and it's certainly not what I want to be. Uh, what I want to be, and what I hopefully am, is, you know, like a, just a dedicated athlete who is, you know, striving to do the best he can. You know, I'm hopeful of beating a lot of people. If I don't beat a lot of people, well, I'll beat as many as I can. But the, the important thing is to do the best I can. And uh, my, my motives are selfish. I'm doing it for myself. You know, just the feeling, the gratification that I get from having had a good day and having had a good training year. He is now 37, living life in spite of the motorcycle accident that took his leg at the age of 19. He has run marathons, other triathlons, even the steps of the Empire State Building. Now all he wanted was to be an Ironman. In the men's race, the leaders had entered the lonely zone, the lava fields. Scott Tinley was 18th out of the water. Here he moved into sixth, six minutes behind the leader, but really moving. Danny Banks held second spot, and he was four minutes behind Hinshaw. Banks also decided to start eating early. Important here, the longest segment of the race. Neither Banks nor Tinley were in sight of Chris Hinshaw, who was really surprised me in that he had followed a great swim, his best event with such a strong start of the bike. Chris felt that maybe he was riding more than a bike, though. Maybe a dark horse. I'm very strong in this race mentally. I think I'm considered to be one of the dark horses, and I could pull off a win if the opportunity is there. Uh, if I'm giving a slight lead, and you can guarantee I'll run scared, and I, I don't know, I think there is the possibility that I could win. The Hawaiian pili grass that had somehow grown in the ancient lava flows moved by in a blur. The skies were cloudy, the air was cool, and the bike turnaround at Javi was 25 miles away. He thought of Javi constantly, and that was funny because that small village had never meant this much to him before. If paradise consists solely of beauty, then these islands were the fairest paradise man ever invaded. So said James A. Michener clearly before he was ever challenged by the desolation of the Kona coast. Less than two hours into the race, swimmer Robin Masters was still holding on to the lead as Juliana Brenning here rode a minute or so back in second place. But redhead Julie Moss, pressing hard, head down, blew by Brenning into second with a psychological unfriendliness that seemed to say, sorry, no time to chat, I'm on my way to the front of the troops. Four or so minutes later, the Stanford scholar, Joanne Ernst, also approached the tough Brenning to buy for third position. A look at these two lean, muscular, well-trained bodies, both in a full sweat, grinding against a 35-mile-per-hour headwind, neither wanting to be broken, was to witness a new plateau of athletic prowess for the top women triathletes. Now, the first few dozen women were to be looked at with nothing but respect. won the battle for third. Remember Paloma Roales-Brown of Seattle and her panic-stricken start? 
She survived the swim, missing the two-hour, 15-minute safety cutoff by only 16 minutes. While Julie Moss was far away from being cut off by anyone, and she passed Robin Masters to take the lead two hours, nine minutes into the race. Few expected her to be in the lead this early. Only minutes before the swim course was to be closed, the senior citizen of the Ironman wobbled onto the pier. 70-year-old Edson Sauer greeted us with a smile, and we smiled back. A self-proclaimed athletic addict, number 1,000, only had 138 miles to go. All this as Dave Scott caught up to the men's leader, Chris Hinshaw. The swim was a little tiring. There's no one's draft on it. Yeah, well, you had to do the dirty work. You had a pretty good lead, though. How do your legs feel right now? My calves are tightening up, so I slowed it down a tad. Uh-huh. I got to pace myself. Your gearing feel pretty good? I feel good. See it? Good. Yeah. Stay with I'm it. Looking forward to the run for once. All right, great. Chris was battling the famous headwinds that whistled through the hills of Kohala and winning. His lead was up to eight minutes over second man Danny Banks, who was spinning his sprocket and thinking happy thoughts of home. Go on, I. Scott Tinley was gaining right here only three minutes behind Banks. He was at a part of the course where he could really excel the seven-mile climb up to Javi. Also notice his new wind tunnel tested handlebars and aerodynamic socks worn over his shoes. Edson Sauer was pacing himself, showing no hurry in leaving the friendly folks at the transition. But in the end, he pulled away, promising to return before the midnight deadline. By now, the two-hour, 15-minute swim cutoff had passed, and anyone still in the water was told that their triathlon was over. Such was the case with Sister Madonna Buddha. The 55-year-old nun from St. Louis had broken more bones in training accidents than she could remember. And now, she had dreams to match. Can we get you back here to try again? I hope so. I really want to. I feel sorry for the people who donated this beautiful bike that it didn't get used. I don't think they think they wasted it. <laughs> I hope not. We'll see you here next year. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Three and one half hours into the Ironman triathlon. Julie Moss with a three minute lead, also battling the steady energy draining wind. Her efforts in this sport are pointed towards erasing one of those unique video memories where defeat is what lingers. Like Bingo Bogota's spectacular crash at Oberstorf. You remember the moment, but do you remember his name? Like the kid from the University of Minnesota, Brian Meeker. Did you remember him? It was 1982. Julie Moss wobbling down Ali'i Drive, only yards from a victory that was not to be. I think I could have won if I just walked. Somehow it didn't seem right to walk across the finish line. Pride, ego, whatever, something got in the way, but I definitely had this idea that I should run across the finish line because if someone were to pass me walking, that just was not acceptable. I mean, I could get past running, but I couldn't get past walking. Julie did not walk. She did not run. She crawled through the darkness, her mind blurred by pain and by second place. Kathleen McCartney was the winner. As the result, I got passed, you know, on the ground, so it didn't quite work out. Now I would have no problems with walking across the finish line. What's happened in the last three years? Fill in the blanks for me. I've uh, been a jock. Three years ago, I got a passport and I filled every page but one. My last acquisition was my passport stamp to China. So, I mean, I've been all over the world, and it's because of triathlons. It was because of that one race. It was a naive athlete and free spirit that followed her boyfriend to Hawaii and the triathlon four years ago. She decided to enter herself as a fluke. Today, the California girl is a professional triathlete bent on material success. She has the magazine covers, endorsements, and lots of attention. Mainly, though, Julie is trying to win so that everyone can't forget. But she's doing pretty well in the meantime.
I see Julie, and I see what Julie's doing, and I see what some of her close friends are doing. And at this particular time, they're, they're being very successful. They're happy. It's a healthy life. I guess now that I've been living with it almost, it's, uh, it's not so unusual. But I didn't think that four years ago. <laughs> I think I'm settling down a little bit more. Um, 27, I've got to get out of the sport pretty soon. I mean, the sun's already taken its toll. I've got all these wrinkles and things. So, I don't know. Yeah, I, there's some changes coming up. But I still have my, some really important things to accomplish in this sport now before I, before I exit. So, I think that's kind of the hook that keeps everybody into what they're doing. I just, I just want to get to this one point, and then maybe I'll think about doing something else. And that one point always is one step away. Things have been pretty quiet in the village of Javi ever since the sugar plantation closed, except on triathlon day when it is the all-important bike turnaround. This was men's leader Chris Henshaw whirling past the town theater carrying a six-minute lead. The sun even shined on him for the first time since daybreak. And he was the first that could get ready for the tailwinds and the ride back down the Kohala Hills. On the way, he would pass everyone chasing him. The chase was 52 miles old. It carried past the volcanic slopes of Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa. As Hinshaw prepared for the 60-mile return trip, Banks and Tinley were close behind. Banks would be the next one to reach Javi, but he was still trudging up the hills in a very high gear. His cadence was slower. He looked like he was setting himself up for fatigue problems. To make matters worse, his lead over Scott Tinley was only 60 seconds. Tinley continued to chip away. He was aerodynamic, his chin was close to the bar, and his head was down, and he had made up an unbelievable five minutes and seven miles. So many triathletes you meet almost force you to ask why. Carol Harrington is a successful businesswoman with two kids, yet here she was trying to forget about being homesick to the point of almost giving up. Yes, we were forced to ask why. There is an, an awful lot in me that says, you know, what am I trying to prove? What is this going to prove? Um, what is this going to mean to the rest of my life? And it's been, but I've been here two weeks, and I have constant sorting out of, of how is this going to enrich my life and my children's life and my husband and make my business better. I think it's, if I do this, I think I will honestly feel like I can almost do anything. Um, you know, I am really mediocre at all these things. I'm not a hardcore uh, triathlete like a lot of these people. I had to qualify for this. And um, I went through a lot of these emotions. And many people said, who would ever leave their family and go off and do their own thing like this? I mean, if my wife ever did exactly what you said, if my wife wanted to do this, I'd tell her to get another husband. And um, yet there were those people that said to me, hey, you may never have another chance. So, and I might not. You're just for my kids. Back to Joanne Ernst, second place woman, two minutes behind the leader, Julie Moss. We eavesdropped a little bit. Go, Joanne. Oh, Long ride. Yep. I'm content to sit, man. <laughs> Wait for that run. You look real strong. Thanks. You can run her down. Yep. Four hours into the race, Danny Banks, in second place for just about 70 miles, was next to succumb to Scott Tinley, who could not relate at all to the contentment of being in third or even in second. Tinley would be content only when he had Henshaw and his lead. With this move, he had Banks. The driving veteran was four minutes behind the less experienced leader, who by then probably felt like a fugitive with the sheriff on his tail. It is a joyous moment in the Ironman triathlon when you're the leader with the wind at your back. Got a tailwind. Chris Hinshaw was having the ride of his life, but so was the air-cooled machine, Scott Tinley. He showed no sign of weakness, having been on the go for four and a half hours. That was remarkable. Then there was Paloma Roales Brown, the Spanish interpreter from Seattle. No tailwind could help her. It's been a difficult day, Paloma. 
Time. Whatever I finish or not, it's not so important. I'll come back next year. You will? Oh, yes. And it will be different. There was the ocean, the wind, the hills. And slowly they took their toll. They have a way of taking your dream and tossing it at the side of the road. You could see it on the face of Chris Hinshaw, who for the first time began to show the strain of being in the lead and of being chased. There was no such look to Scott Tinley. Every turn of the pedals seemed stronger than the one before. race had developed much like the men's. Julie Moss had pedaled hard throughout the hilly lava fields, and with a quick stretch and renewed determination, she seemed to be buckling down already for the long, painful marathon ahead. She had fortified herself well by this point with constant intake of bananas, oranges, and liquids, even advising other riders to stuff themselves for the upcoming run. Behind Moss, the ever-cool Ernst was still holding back until the run. We had asked her earlier what made her tick as an athlete. I think determination um, and my perfectionism. I'm definitely a perfectionist, which can be a good and a bad thing. I get, I get really down on myself, even when, I, when, even when I win races. I always find room for fault. But at the same time, I think that that part of my personality pushes me to succeed. I'm, I'm really driven. And she was driven here, less than a mile behind Julie Moss. It's been a long day already. I swim with better than I'd hoped even. So. Scott Binder went to school at Nebraska and will soon become an accountant near his home in Denver. As he reads his letter to the Triathlon Selection Committee, you will see he ran every mile for mom. During the past 15 months of my life, I've dedicated myself toward the goal of competing in the Ironman, not only for myself, but for my mother. I realize that this sounds corny and that everyone has a special reason for desiring entry into the Ironman. But please continue to read and consider why my situation is special. At age 42, my mother was hit with cancer of the colon. Surgery at the Mayo Clinic removed part of the colon, but doctors doubted they got all the cancer. Two years later, at age 44, my mother discovered she was pregnant. Most doctors recommended not having the baby because of the danger to both her and the baby. Mom refused, had the baby, me, and continued to fight on. Now, after two artificial hip implants and deterioration of the spine and hands due to arthritis, she continues to be supportive of my athletic endeavors. Not only does she encourage me verbally, but she trains with me. At age 68, she still rides her bike next to me as I run, pushing me towards greater accomplishments. My athletic endeavors are a way for her to enjoy things she can't do due to her physical limitations. I realize that you have many special requests, but please consider my situation and help me to fulfill not only my dream, but more importantly, my mother's dream. Sincerely, Scott H. Binder. Did your mom say anything to you this morning, Scott? Just that she loved me. Nothing else. Five hours, 42 minutes into the day, Chris Hinshaw searched for the right gear to carry him to the end of what was a great bike run. The only problem was that Scott Tinley's pace was better. The lead had fallen to a minute and a half. Only 90 seconds between Hinshaw and the man possessed, Scott Tinley. It was time for the marathon. The sign said to finish, but it was really only the beginning of an important time for Chris Hinshaw. His bike time of four hours, 57 minutes, and 50 seconds was the third best in the history of the Ironman. However, the day was five hours and 48 minutes old. Tinley rolled into the transition, revealing his experience. His shoes were already loosened, and while he knew he was gaining on Hinshaw, he wasted little time. In fact, his overall time was the fastest ever for the cycling leg. 
Scott is notorious for his quick changes in the transition area, and that always worried me when I competed against him. He changed on the run. As you can see, he didn't even enter the changing room. As Chris Hinshaw emerged from the transition with that hat on, he resembled Dave Waddle, one of the 1972 Olympic heroes. You may remember Waddle needed a miracle and got it. Now Hinshaw needed one. Tinley had chopped his lead to 45 seconds with that quick transition trick. Something Chris Hinshaw cherished was being taken away. And there was nothing he could do to stop it. Ever since the turnaround at Javi, he heard the countdown of his lead. 12, then eight minutes, six, five, three, one, now 10 yards. Turning around wasn't necessary. The breathing, the footsteps, the cheers. They belong to Scott Tindley. The display that followed showed just how much respect can be earned in a six-hour game of cat and mouse. Like that game, this one may have reached its inevitable end. But while it lasted, it was something to watch. Henshaw had to hold on to what he had. Tinley was 22.2 miles from redemption, looking ready for anything he might find along the way. It hadn't taken Tinley very long to make that move. As a matter of fact, the marathon transition at the Kona Surf Hotel was only four miles ago. Still, though, Tinley had to face the lava fields again and then the return journey. Julie Moss came in with a new women's course record on the bike, but this was no time to dwell on minor accomplishments. The bike leg was eons ago already in her mind as she hastened to change to running singlet and shorts. Ernst was three and a half minutes behind, jaw set with only two visions in her head. One, the tough field behind her, ready to take advantage of any falter, and two, the more immediate concern, the woman who stood or was about to run between herself and the lead, Julie Moss. Moss had improved her running over the year, but the woman coming in face to face with her now was putting on a ton of pressure. Physically, Julie Moss had to shake off the effects of that bike run, something Scott Tinley had been doing. Here's Dave Scott on a Lee Drive. Scott's about five miles into the run. He's trying to get as large a margin as he possibly can before leaving town and approaching the lava fields. He knows that the real race on the marathon starts at about 15 miles. And he knows that at this point, it's just the ability to relax, allow his arms to drop down, shake his legs out. And after an incredible bike leg, He's well on the way to an Ironman record. And as Tinley put on that show of strength, Joanne Ernst exited the transition area, and Diana Nyad was there. That was Joanne Ernst going out of here with a big cheer. She's four minutes behind Julie Moss. Now, three years ago, Julie Moss was in the same position in first place, and I'm sure many of you remember the footage. She came crawling to the finish line and lost. She's out there in the lead, but she knows she has a very fine marathoner behind her, and now the mental side of this Ironman becomes paramount. The premier players were now competing on foot, while in their own private world, hundreds of others kept pedaling away, some not quite looking like triathletes. 45-year-old Ray O'Keefe is an actor, a big actor. In Hollywood, he is known for his roles as a tough guy. Interesting that the role he played on that day in Hawaii was very similar in demand. They uh, were uh, uh, going to shoot a film about Rocky Marciano. And, uh, I was going to play Rocky, and, but I was way out of shape. Because Rocky, his biggest uh, asset was his conditioning. They started running, and, uh, and then the, 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 the film fell through finally. He never did it. But I kind of got hooked on, on running and getting in shape. But then it got a little sporadic. And then I said, you know, I need an incentive. Eventually, that incentive became the triathlon. And along the way, it should be noted that Ray O'Keefe never lost his sense of humor. Anybody else go through here yet? Just a couple of people. I'll catch 
By then, Scott Tinley's story had become almost ludicrous. Comfortably in the lead in one of the body's most grueling tests, he decided to test his football skills with his wife and friends. Chris Hinshaw hadn't come out of their duel as mentally crisp. His hold on second place was fragile at best. You guys can stay with me. Part of the way. Thanks. Just pump. Gotta stay ahead of this guy back here. I've totally slowed down. Of course, I had 16 minutes. Where's my dad? Like son, like father, when it came to running. Like father, like son, when it came to asking. How's Chris look? Ed Henshaw, in the early stages of the marathon, would have been a proud man had he known what a battler he had raised, what a sportsman his son was. For as Chris Henshaw moved along the Queen K Highway, he saw in the distance someone on the way to victory. And he thought the awesome performance of Scott Tinley deserved another salute. Deja vu at the Ironman Triathlon. What had transpired in the men's race was being repeated by the women. Eight and a half hours into the day, Julie Moss on Ali'i Drive looking back, trying to avoid the inevitable. Joanne Ernst, content earlier to sit in second, was content no longer. Ernst took long, powerful strides, honing down her prey. But it was common knowledge that Ernst had suffered chronic hamstring problems, limiting her to an average running schedule of a scant 16 miles per week. Julie relinquished the lead. She had to. But she didn't fade, desperately trying not to let the gap widen. Julie Moss could only hope now for a flare-up of those hamstrings somewhere down the road. And a marathoner named Liz Bullman was on both their minds. There were no more challenges for Scott Tinley. The string of second place finishes would end, and his relationship to the Iron Man would be that of conqueror again. These were moments to savor. He was headed toward a record time with a slick ride on the bike and an unstoppable effort on foot. I've had a fair amount of success in the run course because I seem to do fairly well in the heat. So that's to my advantage. But um, again, you know, especially in the past couple years, I've sold myself short on the wrists and I've given up in the run course and not done as well as I could have. And that's one of the reasons I'm back for this year is to prove myself that um, I can go out there and I can do it and um, I'm not sell myself short. Less than one mile to go to the finish line. Chris Hinshaw's day was far from over. A burst of late afternoon sun made it warm and humid again. And he did his best to keep cool, not knowing of the efforts of 33-year-old Carl Kupferschmidt, a native of the small village of Arosa, Switzerland. His sleek body seemed to be gliding as it went by one-time second place holder Danny Banks to gain fourth. It was a sight that took a little while to get used to for Banks. A European was making a mark where few European marks had been made before. Kupferschmidt, amazingly 308th out of the water, was showing off his stamina, which he earned greatly running in the Alps. And minutes later, Hannes Flaschke of West Germany, another success from across the ocean, lost his third place standing. Maybe this was the little salute he issued to farmers on those training runs in Arosa. Henshaw was 14 minutes ahead. The Ironman returned to its beginnings as it had each year for the finish, to the pier at Kailua and the small beach where the swimmers began at 7 a.m. This was Scott Tinley, cheering himself and cracking that veneer of concentration that he exhibited all day. Dave Scott, is there a better feeling in the world of triathletes than this one? Scott is floating right now. Those last 140 miles are behind him, and this is just a fantastic feeling coming into the finish line. He ran a well-planned race. Beautiful. The day began with the spray of the Pacific and ended with the spray of champagne. Scott Tinley had covered these 140.6 miles faster than anyone had before. Eight hours, 50 minutes, 54 seconds. 
And when I say faster than anyone, I mean you, Dave. He stole your record that day. He not only stole it, Al, he demolished it. Four minutes is a big margin. Who knows, though? Maybe next year I might come back and give Scott a run for the money. But in all seriousness, Scott had a fabulous race. Uh, he went out slow on the bike and methodically picked away at Chris's lead. And it's his victory this year. I love it. I love it. In the women's race, the very worst had come for Joanne Ernst. She was stopping every mile, losing a precious minute or so each time to work out cramps in her thighs, then calves. She had taken aspirin throughout the run, but the grimace on her face showed that the legs were failing. Seven miserable miles to go. The weather had been kind with a cloud cover all day, but Julie Moss hit the marathon turnaround at the hottest point, 94 degrees. She walked, 10 minutes behind Ernst, the game plan more and more muddled in her head. And then there was Liz Bullman, the woman Ernst feared would come on strong at the end. She was in third, making up big ground. After ninth place a few months before at the famous Boston Marathon, Bullman knew how to pace herself. How do you feel? Pretty good. You're looking real strong. Okay. Julie Moss had been one of the favorites. She had the sure voice of a champion at the start. Now she had spent the last 20 miles adjusting to a respectable second place. But a too strong Liz Bullman would drive by her and quickly force a new adjustment to third place. And for the final blow, an unexpected South African named Paula Newby Frazier crept up with a smile and drained Julie's last breath of spirit. She had wanted to win, and now a fourth place that most would cherish dearly seemed a weak, pathetic trophy to Julie Moss. Would she ever erase that image of crawling across the line four years ago? What a contrast there was at the finish. 26 minutes after Tinley crossed the line, Chris Henshaw could finally see it. He could see his pace-setting finish in the swim, his swift, wind-defying cycle run, his courage in the marathon, and the long runs with his father through the hills of Saratoga, California, all paying off. And he would find satisfaction and relief in all of it. Final comments on this game challenger from the Ironman champion, Scott Tinley. Chris, uh, you know, he's a young and upcoming athlete, but he, he's never cycled that well. Um, so I figured, you know, I'll just uh, I'll stay within myself and, and just hopefully he'll come back to me because he's, he was probably going out too hard, and it turns out he was, you know, a lot like what Mark Allen did last year. You know, you, go, you get excited, you get in the lead, and you go too hard, and then it catches up with you in the end. And so um, I think experience really helped this time. When does the training begin again? Um, I'll probably go for an easy swim this afternoon just to loosen up. Out on the Queen K Highway, it had all become too much for Julie Moss to take. Oh, my miles from the end, Joanne Ernst's troubles were compounding. She was walking quite a bit, but her attitude seemed to be, whatever it takes, I'll get there. Go forward, forward, the best I can. She had said before the race that she had come to terms with the notion of self-respect, that she would never forgive herself if she didn't give it everything she had. When she ran, her stride was now one half her usual length. Her spring was dead, but that self-respect was very much intact. The ghost of Liz Bullman continued to haunt Joanne's every step. Liz had called herself slow and steady. Steady, maybe, but not slow. 
well into the first half of the marathon. Chafing, not chasing, was the problem for Pat Christmas, as his artificial leg attempted to go the distance. How about the chafing? Any problem with that? The chafing? Yeah, it was, it was a problem coming in, but I'm not using, putting any stress on it right now. Now I gotta worry about the stump. <coughs> so, uh, so far, so good. A cool day, too, I and mean, that's really a help. It's the best day, you know, since I've been here. How about your right leg? Is that okay? The right leg is dying. <laughs> he only had one leg to stand on, but what a leg that was. 400 yards to go. The clock was ticking down for Joanne Ernst. Despite all her problems, she amazingly was threatening the Ironman women's record. Only a scant one and a half minutes behind, Liz Bowman was valiantly pressing, even though time had evidently run out on her for the victory. It looked like it was finally in the bag for Ernst, but she just had to look back that one more time. Bowman lost her good-natured smile for the first time, and there was only one thing in the world that could inspire those aching legs of Ernst to temporarily zap back to life, and that one thing appeared like an angel before her eyes, the tape. Joanne Ernst would fail only in setting that new record. If she had stopped one less time, she may have had it. But she had raced within a strategy and never deviated. She had raced within a world of pain. She had challenged the Iron Man and won. She missed that record by only nine seconds. One minute, 33 seconds later, it was Liz Bowman's turn. As she crossed the line, she looked like she could have kept on going. Two faces truly lied. It was difficult, really, to tell who the winner was. The people in Kailua, they will remember what they saw. They'll remember Scott Tinley proudly running by, and Chris Hinshaw collapsing with fatigue at the finish. The surprising Europeans, Cooper Schmidt and Blaschke. They'll remember Joanne Ernst's run at the record. Liz Bullman pushing her with everything she had, and Paul Newby Fraser. Here's Diana with a refreshed Joanne Ernst. How hard was it for you? The marathon toward that last six, seven miles looked excruciatingly painful. It was really painful. My calves and my quads were really cramping up, and I felt like the race was slipping away from me, and I was really scared. <laughs> As the sun set in the Hawaiian Islands, we went back out onto the highway for the stories that ended in darkness. Beeping walkie-talkies, soft words of encouragement, the buzz of the generators, tattered people, late night at the Iron Man. Actor Ray O'Keefe. Ray, if you only knew how much you look like Rocky Marciano. Yeah. I was supposed to play him one time in a movie. You told me. Fell through. They may make that movie now. Oh, yeah. Rocky went undefeated, you know. I know it. 49 and 0. 43 by knockout. The only guy that ever fought went with him twice and didn't get knocked out was Tiger Ted Lowry. Last place last year and struggling again. Only a couple of days before the race, we asked him to play a role, a coach for himself. Come on, come on, keep it up, will you? Hey, give me a break. Who are you kidding? You can finish this thing. Come on, don't, don't, don't con me. You can't con an old con. Let's keep it going. You know what I said? I told you that yesterday, and I, and I was talking to you last night about this. Don't quit now. Come on, your feet don't hurt that bad. Your feet have hurt worse when you're walking out in the street shopping with your wife. Come on. Come on, get in here. Do it. Come on, here you go. Just, just, just all downhill from here. You got it. Right there. There it is. There, there's the finish line. Right ahead. Go for it. Carol Harrington made it too. The mother of two, the businesswoman who had almost given up and packed her bags, could now do so without leaving Kona with her self-asked questions unanswered. But first, there was some unattended business to attend to. Hi, guess what? 
I did. Yes, I did. I finished in under 14 hours. No. Uh-uh. Are you glad? <laughs> oh, I knew that you'd be waiting. Are the boys still up? Well, you better wake them up because I want to tell them. Okay. Scott Binder finished his race for mom in fine style. He had postponed his new accounting job in Denver just to finish the Iron Man because his mother could not. I to say the bike was worse than I thought it would be. This one was better. The run's been relatively pleasant, considering the fact. Just think, after this, you get to take a real job. Kind of looking forward to sitting at the desk. Scott Binder finished happily in the middle of that crowd, and by nightfall received that well-earned embrace. I love you, Scott. I, I knew you'd do it. You Thanks could for your do prayers. it. They were all yours. <laughs> I'm glad it's over. I am too. I don't know what we'll do from now on. Thanks for your support. I gotta get to work. Make some <laughs> right. money. Right. Edson Sauer never wavered. Edson, how's the race going for you? Okay. You look like the picture of health to me. I'm doing pretty good. A bad Ed swim. You had a bad swim? Any doubt in your mind that you'll go across the finish line? Oh, I don't think so. What's the key to this race if you had to pick out one word? Training, I suppose. Looks like determination to me. Well. That's second word. Any major problems, or you feel pretty good? I feel pretty good. I had a flat tire. Well, I don't know much about fixing tires. I know you just barely missed that cutoff last year. Are you keeping your eye on the watch pretty carefully this year? Well, I quit on the bike last year. If I shouldn't have, I could have made it, I think. We'll see you, see you at the finish line. Okay. Always. Seventy-year-old Edson Sauer did not grow any older that day. No, he showed us how young he really was. And then there's the Episcopalian eight, priest, six, Jim six, Curtis. Six, At age 67, he was trying where he previously had failed. What do you think the people in your parish would think if they saw you right now? Well, they gave me a bunch of balloons and a great send-off. So I guess they think it's rather remarkable. And it is. He was the only competitor left on the course flirting dangerously with the midnight deadline that would have cut him off and ended his day prematurely. The 3,000 dedicated volunteers never deserted him, nor did his spirit, nor did the people of Fenville, Michigan. No, there was no way the Reverend would finish this alone. minutes to spare. It was a piece of cake. The race was over, but we must reflect once again to the most inspiring story we covered, to Pat Griskus, courage and attitude like the Iron Man had never seen. How's that leg, Pat? Hang it in there. You know, it's, uh, I'm just tired, that's all. I'm cramped up. You know, I don't know. I'm coming in, so I'll be all right, but, uh, and I'm going to break the 14. I hope. That's what you wanted to do, right? That's what I wanted to do. But, uh, geez, I'm not going dancing later on.
couple of months I pass you somewhere and ask you what your memory of the triathlon is, what do you think you'll say to me? I'd have to say this is a, this is maybe, I don't want to be maudlin, but this is maybe the finest thing I've ever done. It really is. I mean, it's, uh, I never thought I would do something like this. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, Jesus, I mean, you know, I, I did a, you know, I didn't do bad today. And I, I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I'd like to do better, but I mean, but this, this is, this, this is an accomplishment. And this is something I'll be proud of for the rest of my life. In the cool of the Hawaiian night, the finish line became the stage for all the emotions we possess. Ed Hinshaw will talk proudly to his family about finishing 127. One by one, they moved over that elusive line, having punished themselves through that long, long day. So easy to watch, maybe criticize, and wonder why. Paraphrase Teddy Roosevelt, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause. Who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement. And who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while doing greatly. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. For Diana Nyad and Dave Scott, I'm Al Troutwick. It was a day we'll never forget. ABC's Wide World of Sports has been brought to you by Bud Light. Everything else is just a light. By Mercury, cars that have kept up with the times as much as you have by GTE Sprint. When you call Sprint, you've got the future on the line. And by Barbasol Shaving Cream, a great shave at a great price. Travel arrangements made through and a promotional fee paid by United Airlines. United flies more people to Hawaii than any other airline. Nobody knows Hawaii like United.